It's always a pleasure to be here with you and a privilege to bring you God's word this morning. I was asked to come today uh, to preach on actually the last sermon I preached at my church at Grace EV Free La Mirada. And we're going through a series in Proverbs, taking themes in Proverbs and uh, teaching on those themes. And I was assigned the topic of money in the book of Proverbs. Now, with <laughs> with a subject like money and, and so vast, I feel like I should start with a couple disclaimers. Uh, first, being money tends to be kind of a taboo subject, isn't it? And there are several reasons why that is. One, there are televangelists, some uh, who are charlatans that manipulate their spiritual authority in order to extort people from their money. One of the worst impressions people have of the church is they're always asking for money in order for their own selfish gain. A second reason why money tends to be a taboo subject as well, the prosperity gospel, which believes that Financial blessing and physical well-being is always the will of God. And if you're not experiencing those things, there's something deficient about your faith. Well, we could look at the example of the Apostle Paul and Jesus Christ himself to know that that's not true. So when we read passages that actually promise prosperity and wealth, we tend to read them quickly or ignore them altogether in order to distance ourselves from the prosperity gospel. Finally, uh, I think why money tends to be a taboo subject is we tend to think of it as a private issue. We don't really pry into people's lives about how they handle money. And even our own mentality could be like, well, look, it's my money. I get to do what I want with it. It tells me what to do with my money. Well, understand that that attitude is more American than it is biblical. The Bible speaks a great deal of what we need to do with our money. And as a result, I think the church and Christians in general tend to be gun shy when broaching this topic about money. How many accountability groups have you been a part of that you were ever asked, hey, how are you handling your money? Are you handling it in a way that honors and glorifies God? Probably very few of you, if any. Uh, you tend to talk about the different vices that people could get into or relational struggles within a marriage or between parent and child. Uh, but rarely does the, money, the subject of money ever come up. And I think we could acknowledge there has been perversion and abuse under the guise of Christianity. What we must not do, however, is to remain silent on the topic. And since we don't talk about money, we don't know how to talk money, but the best way to combat falsehood is to confront it with truth. The best way to fight against perversion is to teach what is right and what is good. Second disclaimer I need to give, uh, with, again, with a subject so vast, I'm not trying to be comprehensive this morning. No doubt, after today, you're going to leave with questions. You'll probably say, hey, Junior, but what about, and insert your questions. I have no doubt that'll be the case. I would encourage you to take that as an opportunity to go back to your grace groups and your friends and family, take the principles we'll learn today, and see how it could work out in your personal lives. And if you still have questions, contact the church, make an appointment with Dominic. He'll answer all your questions. He's got nothing but time on his hands. All right. So today, I want to give some basic biblical principles in building a foundation in our attitudes and actions towards money, wealth, and possessions. And the reason for this is because our attitude, actions, and our actions concerning money and possessions reveals our spiritual condition. It reveals what we think of the character of God and how we handle our economic life is a window into our soul. And the gospel needs to touch every facet of our lives, including how we handle money. So first foundational truth is that Proverbs speaks about money in positive ways. It speaks about money in positive ways, yes. And one way it speaks positively is that sometimes God indeed blesses people with wealth. And if God created it, it is good. For riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness, Proverbs 8.18. The blessing of the Lord makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it, Proverbs 10.22. And another way that Proverbs speaks positively about wealth is wealth can be a sign of wise living. 
So the implementation of wisdom with your wealth can put you on good financial ground. The crown of the wise is their wealth, but the folly of fools brings folly. Chapter 14, verse 24. See, so wealth is God's gift to us. It's a reflection of God's goodness towards us. And just like any gift, it could be twisted, it could be misused, it could become idolatrous. So to avoid turning money into an idol, we must recognize its limitations. And the first limitation is that it won't deliver you from the wrath of God. It won't save you. So no matter how high your net worth is or how much money you have in your bank account or how robust your portfolio might look, it will not save you from the wrath of God. For riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Proverbs 11.4. So not only will it not deliver you from the wrath of God, it's also temporary. It's temporary. For riches do not last forever. And does a crown endure to all generations? Proverbs 27, 24. So not only will it not deliver you from the wrath of God and that it's temporary, therefore we don't put our ultimate trust in wealth. For we know the true source of life is a right relationship with God and a right standing with God. For whoever trusts in riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. Proverbs 11, 28. So in addition to recognizing its limitations, we must also prioritize fearing God above else, everything else. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1, 7. So let's begin this topic with some fear and reverence, knowing that this matters to God. And this, and it should matter to us. And that fearing the Lord is more important than money itself. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Proverbs 15, 16. The reward for humility and the fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. Proverbs 22, 4. Again, let's approach this topic knowing that God cares about how we handle money. And we should care too. But let's have a balanced approach, a balanced approach of, uh, and a view of money grounded in the scriptures, understanding that money itself is not evil. For it's the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. First Timothy 6.10 See, it's the love of money, specifically the acquisition of money and the power and the prestige that may come with it. Loving that above loving the Lord, that is what's evil. Understand, poor people could love money. Money is amoral. What do I mean by amoral? Well, just like a brick is amoral. You could take a brick and break a window with it, or you could take a pile of bricks and build a hospital with it. The brick doesn't care what you do with it. It's amoral. In much the same way, money is amoral. It doesn't care what you do with it. We are the moral agents that dictate what we ought to do with money, how it will influence the world, and how it will impact the kingdom of God. So it doesn't care what you do with it. But here are three principles, three biblical principles on what we need to do. Is one, sacrifice. Two, save. Three, spend. Sacrifice, save, and spend. So the first principle, sacrifice, namely sacrificial giving, honoring the Lord with your wealth first. And if you have your Bibles, you could turn to Proverbs chapter 3, Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, starting in verse 9. And it reads... Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Interestingly, if you look just a few verses before, in verses 5 and 6, it says, Trust the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. See, there's a connection here, and the command to trust God with all our heart means that the total person is committed to God's care. It's an exhortation to the reader 
to demonstrate gratitude toward and confidence in God rather than wealth. And we trust God and his character and his word and his promises when he says he will never leave us or forsake us. And one of the ways we display gratitude towards and confidence in God is by generously giving, not out of guilt, not out of compulsion, but, be, but cheerfully, joyfully, and with liberty, and out of love because he first loved us. And in Romans, Romans, you don't have to go there, Romans 8.23, it reads, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. Again, this idea of first fruits of the Spirit, and if you've placed your faith in Christ, you have received this first fruits of the Spirit. And what does it mean uh, that we receive this first fruits of the Spirit? Well, it's the first installment of our salvation. It's a pledge that guarantees our ultimate redemption at the end of the age. And in Ephesians chapter 1, it says, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is a first installment of our inheritance in regard to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. So if it's merely the first installment, what does it imply that there are more installments to come? See, if we receive justification, preservation, and the promise of glorification, justification for the forgiveness of our sins, preservation that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, and future glorification when we're in the presence of God and he allows us to be in the presence of his son, Jesus Christ. And because God has been generous and gracious to us, we could therefore be generous and gracious to other people. And the acknowledgement that we have received our first fruits is giving of our first fruits of our labor and our income. It's an acknowledgement that, yes, I have received the Holy Spirit. In this ironic twist of God's economy, when you give, you tend to get more. See, giving generously often leads to acquiring further wealth and spiritual benefits. But poverty awaits the stingy. In Proverbs 28, 22, it reads, a stingy man hastens after wealth and does not know that poverty will come upon him. One freely gives, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched. And one who waters will himself be watered. Proverbs 11, verses 24 and 25. See, now, I spend a ton of time on my personal budget. It's a framework I've just built into my life. It's just like getting up in the morning and brushing my teeth. And I've spent years constructing a decision-making paradigm where when I know I receive money, I know exactly what to do with it. It alleviates anxiety, brings great clarity. I give every dollar an assignment and I tell it to go to work. And giving is right there at the top. It's routine. There's clarity. There's not a question involved. But there are these times where spontaneous giving happens, unscheduled opportunities that come up based on need. Now, there are needs all over the place. We as individuals can't possibly meet them all. So be discerning when deciding what to do above and beyond your normal giving. Whether it's a missionary or Christian organization or specific needs and of other families or individuals, um, when my wife and I decide to move forward in giving above our normal giving, depending on what the need arises, God always seems to bless us. I didn't schedule it in the budget, but it always seems to balance out for some reason. I don't know, maybe my calculator's broken, but I can't tell you the nuts and bolts of how that happens. I do the math all the time and it just simply works out. And I believe when we live by faith and we extend that faith and grace to other people by giving and meeting a need, God blesses us. And we fall in this cycle of sanctification as we take a step of faith to give, God shows himself faithful. And as God shows himself faithful, we become more confident in who God is. 
and we step out again, and God shows himself faithful every time, and we're blessed by it, and we become more confident, and then the cycle continues every time we step out in faith. When we don't give, well, is it because we love money and the security that it brings us? Or we just have this sense of entitlement that we don't want to sacrifice certain things? You know what? I, I get to go out and eat every day. I should have the latest and greatest device. I should drive a nice car. Well, understand that if you do that at the expense of honoring the Lord, those are heart issues. And at its core, it's a refusal to honor God with our first fruits and a reflection of how we view the character of God. Hey, I don't think God's really going to bless me, so I better bless myself. But understand that stinginess stifles flourishing. Stinginess stifles flourishing. See, a part of being created in God's image is that we have moral agency. And by agency, I mean the exercise of a person's choice insofar that they're capable to make things happen in the world, to affect or prevent changes within the world in which we live. And generosity, by definition, represents a form of agency exercise, that is, purposeful interventions of giving intended to convey valuable things to others in order to enhance their good. And when we exercise that agency for change, we're reflecting God's generosity and we flourish more, not only as human beings created in his image, but redeemed people of God in Christ's image. Now contrast that with the view of people who say, you know, I can't really make a difference in this world. What are my few dollars really going to matter? Well, understand that there's no hope or purpose in that sentiment. And people who live in this perceived world of scarcity and deficiency and insecurity, they tend to hoard things. And when you hoard things, it results in other ways that you're impoverished, namely being anxious, feeling vulnerable, and ultimately unsatisfied. No, that's not the people of God, because God is rich in mercy, and being redeemed image bearers of God, it gives us purpose and meaning. And we believe that God is rich, and he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. So our decisions matter. Our giving matters. And our giving impacts eternity. Yes, earthly riches are temporary. Oh, but they can be powerful if used properly. They could steer eternity. And one example, you know, recently uh, my wife and I adopted a two-year-old boy from India. Uh, we picked him up last November. It was a long two-year process. And as many of you know, international adoption is quite expensive. And yes, my wife and I planned and saved, and we uh, paid a good portion of it. But through the generosity of other people, through the scholarships funded by the generosity of other people, we didn't bear that financial burden alone. And as a result, we were able to take a child who had no home, who had no family, and give him a home and give him a family. And as a result, his life has changed and our life has changed. And maybe, just maybe, someday, his eternal destination may change. Yes, our giving impacts eternity. Economic life can be eternal life. And when we give sacrificially, it pushes out greed and selfishness within our own hearts and deepens our ability to love other people well. It fights against consumerism and immediate gratification and self-indulgence. But before you start thinking, hey, I need to give everything away, well, let's be wise in our approach with wealth and possessions. Let's be balanced and holistic in our approach we could give everything away and feel spiritual godly, but if it causes yourself and your family harm, well, that's being foolish. Paul tells Timothy, provide for your household. And if you don't, you have denied the faith and you're worse than an unbeliever. I don't know a worse thing you could tell a Christian that you've denied the faith and you're worse than an unbeliever. You think some heinous crime or some heinous sin was attached to that. But no, if you failed in your mandate to provide for your family, that's you. Which leads to our second point, is to save. So yes, sacrificial giving, but we must also save. He who gathers in the summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings 
shame, Proverbs 10, 4 and 5. And understand, money can provide protection as well. A rich man's wealth is his strong city. The poverty of the poor is their ruin, Proverbs 10, 15. So you understand that things break. Cars break down, water heaters break down, roofs need to be replaced. I'm always perplexed at people like, oh man, when these things happen, wait, these things don't last forever and we're completely caught off guard. No, they don't last forever. They do need to be replaced. So be prepared. And you know, on a side, when we read rich man in the Bible, particularly in Proverbs, you know, I think we need to take our mindset out of our Western American uh, middle class ideals. Because I know my mind, it goes to, oh, rich man. He's talking about Oprah Winfrey or Bill Gates, LeBron James. I, I know that's where my mind goes. And, and yes, relatively speaking, they're, they are rich and way wealthier than we are. But when it comes to global standards, you know, middle America, which I assume is most of us here, we are rich indeed. Think of technology as wealth. You have a device right now in your pockets or your purse that has access to a thousand servants that could fetch you whatever piece of information you want. You have access to every library, a camera, a phone, a video camera. We would be the envy of ancient kings. So yes, this applies to us. Are you managing your servants well? Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but he who gathers little by little will increase it. Proverbs 13, 11. More on this verse later. But a biblical example of when it was prudent to save was in Genesis 41, when, Pharaoh, or when Joseph advised Pharaoh, hey, look, this next 14 years, seven years, you can have a robust economy. But the next seven, it's going to be a very bearish market. So you need to take these robust years, plan and save and get ready for the lean years. And the implementation of that plan, not only did he save an entire country, but he saved his family. And he not only saved his family, but using that plan, he preserved the messianic line that eventually led straight to Jesus through prudent saving. So saving money isn't bad in and of itself. It's often very wise to do so. It's the reason why you're saving, which makes all the difference in the world. So when saving is wrong, it's when it's motivated by selfishness, greed, fear, hoarding without purpose, using it for self-indulgence, which leads to neglecting to give, neglecting to pay off debt, neglecting to save for the future, neglecting to meet the needs of others. That's when saving is wrong. And two key aspects in order to save well, you need two things. You need contentment and diligence. You need contentment and diligence. In Proverbs 13, 7, it reads, One pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. Now, this verse could be talking about a man exercising prudence and contentment. You know, often if you see somebody with fancy clothes or a high-end car, you know, you might think, hey, they, they look pretty wealthy. But if they're knee-deep into debt, well, they're actually wearing their wealth, and they don't really have anything but depreciating assets that they're wearing uh, on themselves. Whereas you could have a person who just diligently saves and may not look any different than you and I and has great wealth. You know, I, I work at a, at a school, and uh, every time, the first couple of weeks before school starts, the staff members park cars on campus, and you get to see everybody's cars. And for years, I had the second worst car in my staff. Right? I'm like, man, second place, that, that stinks. But finally, the person with the worst car retired. So now I have the worst car of my staff. In April, it'll be 24 years, this Ford Explorer. You know, Dom, Dom and other friends harassed me about when am I going to get a new car all the time. But you know what? I, and there's a hundred things wrong with it. I, I don't, I, you know, if you ridicule me, I could tell you, I mean, it's, it's terrible. But I love that piece of junk. It's gotten to the point where I actually enjoy driving it. It's, you know, my wife thinks I'm sick, actually. But 
I find just great joy in driving it. And there's, yes, there's things wrong. It's uncomfortable and whatnot. But the, I mean, the chair is like contoured to my body and, and you know, the check engine light, uh, it was on for like three years and, you know, and then it turned off and it's like, well, did it fix itself? And the mechanic just said, no, the bulb burned out, man. Like, it's just, <laughs> cars don't fix themselves. I'm like, okay, okay, just want to be sure. So I don't even know, it might be something still wrong with it. But, but there is something... When you don't care about appearances, when you don't care about superficiality and materialism, it frees you from that bondage. You can actually find joy in, in things like that, as opposed to feeling like you're missing out on something. Because godliness with contentment is great gain. So contentment, you need contentment and you need diligence. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. In all toil there is profit, but mere talk tends only to poverty. Proverbs 14, 23, the plan of the diligent leads surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty only comes to poverty. Proverbs 21, 5, takes hard work to save, diligence. And again, Proverbs 13, 11, wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Let me give you an illustration of this verse here. Say a 21-year-old gets his first job and immediately opens a Roth IRA and decides, hey, you know, I'm going to contribute $100 a month, averages out to $1,200 a year. Let's say he got a modest rate of return of 10%. At age 65, he will have $1.6 million. $1.6 million. You know, $100 a month, if we budget well, we probably don't even feel that. But now, let's take that $1.6 million and just give it to the 21-year-old. You know, you should feel like a collective groan with that idea, right? I know I do. If you would have given me that kind of money at 21 years old, I definitely would have squandered it. I probably would have ruined my life. And, and we feel that, don't we? We feel the temptation of wealth. And we see it in young professional athletes and lottery winners all the time. I remember this TV show uh, when I was a teenager that actually tracked uh, what people did with their lottery winnings. Right? And I remember I was a teenager, I was watching this, and this one guy, of course, they always buy a big house, they buy a big house, and he had this room full of samurai swords and stuffed armadillos. I had no idea how many different types of stuffed armadillos you could have. Oh, look, there's one on his hind legs. There's one on his forehead, for all four of his legs. There's one posing like the Heisman Trophy. It's like, good grief. I remember as a kid thinking, you're a grown man, and this is what you spend your money on. Ridiculous. See, now, if you were foolish before you had money and somebody dropped a big bag of cash on you, you're not magically going to become wise. If anything, it's going to amplify your foolishness. So we feel that temptation. So yes, wealth is a blessing and a temptation. So temptation of feeling self-sufficient, independence, and not needing the Lord. But aren't all God's gifts intertwined with blessing and temptation? That's not a reflection on the character of God. That's a reflection on our sinfulness, that we could take something good and turn it into something evil. That's on us. But there is something to be said when a person spends a lifetime of self-discipline, planning, exercising delayed gratification, and gathering little by little, that you build within yourself the character and the ability to handle the responsibility of wealth. You would trust that 65-year-old with that $1.6 million, way more than you would the 21-year-old. Which leads to my next point. We don't save just to build wealth and gather wealth. We must spend it. And we must spend it wisely. In Proverbs 8.18, it says, With me, wisdom, are riches, honor, and enduring wealth and prosperity. Proverbs 31, The prosperous woman, she perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the staff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. Proverbs 31, verse 18 through 20. See, 
she hits all these three principles home. She's prepared. She works hard. Her lamp does not go out at night, and she holds her hands in spindle, and she does not neglect the needs around her. See, but spending unwisely can lead to poverty. Foolish behavior leads to poverty. Lazy hand makes for poverty. But diligent hands brings wealth, Proverbs 10.4. And again, he who gathers in the summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps during harvest is a disgraceful son. Now, there are other ways that people are impoverished, namely through injustices and oppression and thievery. I'm not talking about that. People finding in situations no fault in their own. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is a failure to take up personal responsibility. We don't just spend our money to keep up social appearances or use them for escape mechanisms or sinful indulgences or living beyond our means because we're engulfed with materialism. No, whoever loves pleasure will be a poor man and whoever loves wine and oil will not be rich. Proverbs 21, 17. And to be clear, that doesn't mean we can't have nice things. That doesn't mean we can't take a vacation and build wonderful memories with our family, but not at the expense of honoring the Lord first. And certainly using wisdom to do it. If you're up to your eyeballs in debt, maybe now is not the best time to take an extravagant vacation. Be wise. See, being unprepared, it's failing to take up financial responsibility, failing to establish and follow a budget, failing to plan for the future. And in contrast, the prepared life, it takes intentionality the same way pursuing wisdom takes intentionality. The Proverbs all over says you must seek and you must find wisdom. Wisdom cries out. It's accessible, but we must pursue it. And we can't be lazy about it. We have to face it. We have to get started and be faithful enough to see it through and finish and finish well. You know, I'll close with, with an example. We need good examples in our lives because a, a lot more is caught than it is taught. And Phil Davis was my father-in-law. I grew up without a father. He was the closest thing I had to a father. Uh, he was recently killed in a car accident last May. But he hit all three of these principles home. He embodied this very idea that I'm talking about. You know, when my wife and I first got married, he had a rental property, and he rented it out to us well below market value to allow us to live there, to be able to save, to buy our own place. He took a loss every month just so we could save. And in a year's time, we were able to save for a house. And the current house we bought that we're living in now has four of his grandchildren in it. You know, he planned and he budgeted. He was a faithful giver to the church. And more, more than that, he was generous at every opportunity. You know, we have a communion service every Sunday night, and we devote that offering just to the Benevolence Fund based on the needs of members in our church. I remember we'd pass around the basket. He'd just take out his wallet, and he'd just empty his wallet of cash. He didn't even bother counting it. And then he had the audacity after service to invite everyone out to dinner. You know, Red Robin was his favorite restaurant. He'd just gather a bunch of people. Hey, let's go. And I remember, man, I don't even like Red Robin, but I'll eat mediocre food if it's free. Yeah, let's go. It's on dad. And you know, it was more than just getting a free meal. Through those times, he created an opportunity for fellowship and connection. Whether it was a first-time visitor at church or a long-time member, they felt loved and cared for. And lifelong relationships were built during that time, and he made it happen. He also saved and planned for retirement. He calculated the last day to work to maximize his benefits so he could continue to provide for his family. And even though he didn't meet that day, he left provisions in place in case that would happen, that now his wife is not a financial burden to the family and not a financial burden to the church, even though she's a widow. And not only is she not a financial burden through his faithful planning, she could now continue that legacy of generosity within the Davis family. 
You know, one of the things when we were cleaning up and gathering his things, we ran across a couple investment books and trying to piece together conversations that we've had and conversations he's had with coworkers. Uh, it turns out he was getting into the stock market and, and trying to grow his money and realizing that he didn't really need it, but he wanted to learn how to do it because he, he wanted to leave something for the kids. And his oldest son, PJ, who is a pastor of Felton, said he wanted to help PJ get into a house. Yes, he was a good man and a godly man. And a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Proverbs 13, 22. Do we understand that Jesus will entrust those who are faithful now in the future, that if we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything else will be added on? And on that day, the day that Phil Davis, my father-in-law, has already experienced, that he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a few things, but I will put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of your master. See, the gospel needs to touch every part of our lives. Knowing that he, Jesus, is the head of the body of the church, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. What does it mean that Christ is preeminent? It means that he is first in everything. And when it comes to wealth and possessions, is he first in our lives? Does our checkbook reflect, reflect the surpassing worth that is Christ Jesus? Do we know that how we handle our money is a reflection in how we view the character of God? Do we know the stewardship that he's given us can steer and influence eternity? Because to them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this ministry, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And him we proclaim, warning everybody and teaching everybody with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Is the way we handle our money mature in Christ? And remember, a biblical view of money begins with a commitment to honoring God first and keeping in mind that wisdom, righteousness, and the fear of God are things that are of the utmost importance to adequately provide apply the principles of sacrificing, of saving and spending well. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for life. Thank you for all that you've given us. We pray that all that you've given us, we would manage them well for your glory. And it's in your rich and mat matchless name that we pray. Amen.